Uh, the truth is, I, you know, we did do an awful lot of talking, and this is an awful lot of reflection about user stories and what they're used for. I want to, we are going from now until 430. What is the, what is our time we're supposed to be done? 7 p.m. <laughs> no. 445. 445, roughly, I guess. Is Alistair still on the floor over there? Uh, Alistair gave me a piece of advice years ago uh, when it came to teaching or speaking. He said, start late and end early. Uh, 445. So, so I'm going to set an alarm for something that I can, I can live with. To you warn me. What was that? Yeah. I have an app for that. There's an app for that. <laughs> okay, I want to talk through a few concepts, and I'd rather, uh, I, I've got a lot that I, I want to communicate and say, but I want to see if we can contextualize it just a little bit. So let's uh, start from the beginning. Uh, this slide deck would go through a, a bit of a process of having us think through and write a user scenario. And then as we were writing this user scenario, we can extract tasks from it. It's the thinking through what people are doing that helps us find uh, what, people, uh, what people are doing, what actions they're doing. And the, the way you guys did things by talking with each other and writing down stickies as you went is actually the way I, that this is commonly done. At, there are these little uh, quick reference guides that I quickly put together yesterday to try and describe a little bit about how this works. The front side has uh, just a little bit of a taxonomy about what, what I mean by a story map and what are the concepts or what are the things in it. And on the back side is a little bit of a process. So where I want to go through now is talk about a little bit of the process. Actually, before process, uh, let's talk about composition really quick. Um, I like organizing these things into maps of what the user's experience is, map of what people are doing, of, of what, from a user's perspective, the system is about. And uh, of the, all those constituencies wanting to get things out of user stories, I end up thinking from a user's perspective an awful lot, and I end up, uh, my dominant concern actually starts to be understanding the user. Now, uh, because I'm concerned with understanding the user, I like organizing things by stuff that people do. And the biggest thing, or a biggish thing that people do are these things that I refer to as an activity. Now, if we were to speak abstractly for a minute, if, if I were to arrange doing stuff in my house by activity, I might have things like uh, uh, taking a shower and getting dressed and uh, and uh, eating breakfast and doing stuff before going to work and then going to work. And that would be a, a map arranged along those big things. Now, if I was thinking of, uh, if that bothered me, I might start to arrange things by the structure of the house. I might start to arrange things by bathroom and bedroom and kitchen and garage. And that's, uh, I can still sort of get that. And I, the only reason I can get that is because I happen to live in a house and a lot of other people do. And if I was really getting technical about it, I might start to arrange all my stories about a house into plumbing, electrical, heating and air conditioning. Yeah, I must be driving people crazy. You got to do step on my iPhone. <laughs> so, I could arrange stuff in my house by plumbing, electrical, heating, air conditioning, uh, the things like that. Uh, so, uh, for folks that have user story backlogs, how many have a big epic called security in their backlog? You laugh. Is it is that common or? I've seen it. Been there. So, uh, security is often a big thing that people organize backlogs by. Uh, what's another weird big thing that people organize backlogs by? Bugs. What was it again? Bugs. Are you talking about the like cross-cutting concerns? 
Ah, well, is it a cross-cut? Yeah, exactly. Is it a cross-cutting concern? Just like, and again, I'm talking about different organizing mechanisms. Right. A cross-cutting concern in a house is plumbing. Right. And, and for someone who is a, a contractor building a house, I'd want to separate out all those plumbing things. But from a user perspective, plumbing really isn't, uh, I, I don't uh, get up in the morning, wander to the bath bathroom, and think about the toilet as a, a cross-cutting concern. It's uh, something I need right here now. And uh, security is one of those things that kind of hits you or is relevant at different times in the system. So uh, yes, it is a cross-cutting characteristic. But uh, and sometimes the temptation is, in the absence of understanding where security is relevant, we'll organize things that way. Let's, oh, sorry. I had, I had a product owner on a, on a big project come to us and hit us with a whole bunch of illities. You know, uh, reliability, uh, you know, uh, and security defense and like that. And yeah. Same story, there was a reliability story, there was a, uh, uh, all these different abilities that came up that were just monsters. Yeah, yeah and, then, and, uh, and so how did you ta attack decomposing those those monsters? Oh, uh, to be honest, it was, it was really kind of going back and saying, wait, we can't work with these. Let's look at it from a different perspective, slice it differently. You rejected them. <laughs> good, good tactic. Uh, a tactic that works for me sometimes is to uh, uh, tell me a story about where reliability is really important. You give me a concrete example, and it's back to the storytelling we were just doing. And this is also something that resonates with uh, a Brian Merrick mantra, is uh, a, a, an example would be handy right about now. So uh, Brian Merrick's example-driven thinking is exactly the scenario-driven kind of thing that we're talking about here. So where scenarios are concrete examples, but they're concrete fictitious examples, uh, <coughs> when we're talking about reliability, then we can start to find out where and when reliability is important, just like when we're dealing with security. Tell me about a situation where security is important. And then we can start to actually find stories that are about people and where they're relevant and, and ways to test that they're there. I'm gonna spin through the structure of one of these really fast. Uh, the, the structure of one of these things is at the top or at the highest level are uh, some sort of sequence of user activities, stuff that people do and they're just big things. And as a colleague said, Jeff, don't get wound up in what they are and I'll tell you don't get wound up in what they are. They're big things, they're epics, they're whatever you wanna, want to call them, but they're big things. I like activity because it works for me. Below big things are less big things and for me, these are user tasks. These are bigger things that, that people end up doing. And when you're arranging things left to right, just like when you try to arrange things that you did when you got ready for work this morning, there's no right order. People don't do things in the same order every time. Arrange things in an order that helps you tell the story, or you know, these are a token for a conversation. And we're building a, the mother of all tokens. So support, build something that supports a better conversation about what the system is and does. When I find some tasks that occur roughly at the same time, for instance, if I'm building a kiosk and I might search by artist or search by title or uh, search by a combination of genre and language, I can start to pile tasks uh, below each other because there are variations or alternative ways I could do things and start to build down. But I find that in practice people just do things kind of in a nice organic way. And so the important thing is that when I'm done, left to right, I have something that I can see and understand that describes what the product is, that, that is useful for telling stories about the product. And I've got this functional decomposition. I've got this big things and little things that fall inside of it. So I can talk about things uh, at the level that stakeholders might prefer to talk about it, which is at a high level, and I can talk about things in, at, at a detail level. In practice, a long conversation, a day's worth of conversation, results in a model that looks a little bit like this. Uh, that's Gary, and Gary and I talked for a, a day about a product, and the product is on the web now, is something called madmimi.com. Mimi was originally supposed to be a music industry marketing interface. It was, a, it was something for musicians to market their work and collaborate with other musicians, and that's where the term Mimi comes from. 
But at the end of the day, when we talked about his goals and what it was necessary to get to market, uh, this ended up being just a, uh, an email promoting product. It, it, it's something that competes with constant contact. It's actually it's an extremely cool little product, and it's pretty well reviewed and it's newish. Uh, and it, there's a competitor to it called Emma, so we kept the name, he kept the name Mimi because it looks like uh, Emma's mean little sister. The, so the product was good, but we end, at the end of this, Gary saw, ah, oh, crap, what I'm thinking about is really big. And, uh, before we did this, had this conversation, he had no sense of how big the thing was he was thinking of. He had a lot of ungrounded ideas and interesting things, and he'd been actually working with an Agile team for several months and doing highest priority story first. And he said, you know, these guys are getting nowhere. I keep seeing stuff arrive, but it's just it's not it. It's not getting me where I want. Uh, and having this conversation was a bit of a breath of fresh air. <coughs> In practice, again, it's another kind of a big demonstration. This is a big, long, wide model of taking photos all around the room of uh, the, the thing on the bottom is that strung together. So it, it does end up being big, but where I've seen, one of the problems I see in traditional story writing workshops is, uh, first, who in the room has done a traditional story writing uh, work? Uh, is there a traditional story writing workshop? That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, to say, how does it go? How long do they take? And how many stories do you normally get out of one? Well, uh, in a few experiences, they took upwards of half a day to a day. And we ended up with somewhere around 400 to 500 stories uh, in, in those cases. Good. <laughs> well, that's a lot of stories. That's a Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure good is the word. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's a... In hindsight. Wow. How, uh, what is the... Uh, what is the, uh, the uh, the SPM on that, the stories per minute. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was brought in, it was product owners, bringing in product owners with a lot of this, you know, sort of already, they had lists and basically taking their lists and turning them into these, these stories. So this wasn't necessarily the dynamic of the customer conversation, yeah, different the, kind of dynamic. It was a, more of a, uh, an op, uh, offload of yeah. a, a dump of, of what they had, so. I had a completely different experience. I'm talking about, a group transitioning to Agile who brought in a product requirements document spent a better part of a half day and got 20 stories out of it because that's that's all they could do without getting frustrated. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times you see things on the opposite extreme as well where when you're trying to get someone to understand this concept, they struggle. So if you try to get someone to understand it, you end up getting 20 and if uh, my guess is that when you got 400, no one was focusing on understanding the stuff or what were they? There was a lot of uh, waste, how so? Uh, well, because many of those stories were never going to be implemented, uh, and they were hard to manage. You know, they were very hard to comprehend, so we create a monster backlog, which, um, you know, there are people who argue that that's bad yeah. uh, in lean terms, if nothing else. Yeah, it's, it's been a good and, you know, So why would it be such a big backlog based upon any, based upon what we've talked about today? Uh, well, uh, Part of it was, was just the organization had all this stuff stored up and we were, we were transitioning them and it was kind of their sort of cathartic. Uh, my inclination is to believe that there, there was a lot of fine-grained things. Yes. Uh, there were the, uh, the where's the, the guy that took the, the many-step shower is, is gone. Uh, it's, I can't tease him anymore. But, but there, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of those sorts of things. Yeah. So it, it was, it's tough to make sense of 400 of anything. So. Uh, so what I find in practice is that uh, it is a day's worth of doing this or a half day's worth of doing this is very productive and you end up with more stories that you understand uh, than other mechanisms and uh, certainly less than 400 stories. <laughs> so the you know, magic number for me is a, somewhere you know, in the 100-ish range and it really, of course, it depends on how big the product is. One of the things that naturally happens as you're starting to build these uh, if I were to give you a list of anything and tell you to uh, uh, arrange it, people start to naturally deal with... Ah, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm skipping to a, a different sort of slide. That, uh, actually, looking at process... Where is my... I have to steal this 
So I set aside the one that I've got. So I, I find that there's an initial kind of constructing this thing that goes on, and I wrote down in this quick reference that there's three ways. In process, I find that if we know users and we can collaborate with them, we can sit across and we can write the stories as we talk to them. We can collaboratively write stories. So I'm calling that a user interview method, and that's what you guys just did. If we really know the domain well, and it's just stuff we know, and we can rattle off or think through them, we would brainstorm tasks that we do, and then organize those. That's what you started doing, by everybody brainstorming what they specifically did. And I find that when I've got domain experts uh, that know the room, I can just say, okay, let's think about this particular user, and let's brainstorm everything they do. And everybody can dump it out, and then we can organize it. And, and then finally, if uh, you don't, if you, the people that need to organize this backlog, actually aren't your users, don't know your users, and can't get them to sit across from you to do this, you are left with needing to do something to understand them, to to research, to observe, to do something else, and then to get your understanding straight, writing something like a user scenario or a use case or something to understand the narrative works. In past, I've struggled teaching this because I'll try to teach it one way or then another way, and the, the truth is there's lots of successful ways to build these things. So the, the, the slide there is, is about the discussion, and the truth is that discussion is the way that I fall back on most often in an, in an agile context. But dis the discussion requires that you know what you're building. The, the, the really cool thing about starting to build one of these and use cards and lay it out in front of people as you're working is they catch on so quickly it's shocking. I've, can remember sitting with a compliance officer at a big drug company and writing down something she said and her telling me, no, 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 that's, that's on a purple. It's not on a green. She knew it, what I wrote down wasn't big enough. It was a bigger thing. She already had, a, after us talking for 15 minutes, she had a sense for how this worked and could start to, tell, have, we had a richer conversation. And as soon as I start to get this thing left to right, it, it, it enables fabulous words in conversations like this and, and that, and over here, and down there we, and, and up, up there we did, and we start to have really quick conversation, where a conversation around a singular card just isn't that way. I find that once we build these things, it's, it's a sort of cathartic, we get it all out there, but we end up then needing to go through a bit of a process of discussing these things. Uh, we'll walk through these things and talk about them over and over, and, uh, and we'll get more and more details, and sometimes they grow to backlogs of hundreds and hundreds. And, uh, a trick uh, stolen from Ward Cunningham for CRC cards is to write down everything they say and then shovel them underneath the, the cards. And when, when building a sticky note model, I'll write down a lot of sticky notes for details, put them all together and put them underneath a top sticky note so that I can just focus on the, the hundred but not lose the details. So we, we do a lot of shoveling, de writing down really small details and maybe using a different color of card build this right, for little details, and then sliding the details underneath. Ah, darn, built too fast. The, just a photo there is of somebody doing this in a bit of a training class, and you can see yellow cards slid under green cards. It's a nice trick for keeping, pulling the conversation up a level. And the reason this model is so moronically simple is because it's really easy to drag it all together and put a rubber band around it and stick it in your bag when you leave. It doesn't have to hang on the wall. Uh, the slides will be available to download. Okay, now here's where I was going. There is, a, there is a natural tendency for people when they've got stacks of anything to put important things at the top. Uh, we keep talking about those important things and they naturally bubble up. So whether you want it to or not, things will start to arrange themselves vertically in these sorts of lists. And when you start to do this explicitly, you start to see that stuff along the top is really important. And if we were going to build the system, it really has to have some support for this stuff along the top. That's the necessary stuff. You can test this by walking it and telling stories uh, about, about the domain. And I end up using, uh, well, the users might do this as a bit of a test, because if it's low, then it means that they don't have to, it means that they might. Uh, in 
uh, I'd asked somebody about somebody who had picked this up and done a bit of work with story mapping, and I said, I said, well, what's what's the thing that really worked well or was really important for you as a takeaway? And he said, well, that that walking through it and talking through it thing is was really critical or important to us, and I would have never guessed that. But the testing whether things are optional or necessary turned out to be pretty darn important for them, uh, and the walking and talking part is. I find that in practice we'll build one of these things and walk, we may build it in a day, but then we will walk and talk through it with lots of different users and stakeholders for uh, weeks afterwards. Uh, it's, and we keep harvesting it and building up more. So there's a second step on your hand in that says, uh, handout that says fill in and validate, and I find that that goes on quite a while. See if I can, uh, just for color, this ends up being a little bit like one of these, this is one of these conversations over story map. And the conversation was, uh, Brian is the guy talking, and the guy's name writing the sticky note is Sparky. Uh, Sparky is uh, writing down stuff that Brian is saying, and in particular, we're trying to write down stuff that's really difficult for Brian. Where is, it, where is his work a problem? And so now we can have, a, we don't have to have Brian tell him about his process. We can have him talk through the process, and we can start to talk about what's difficult here. And uh, you notice the rich conversation and big hand gestures and uh, productive conversation about the system between somebody who is an analyst and someone who's a user. And uh, the guy drinking coffee at the back is the lead developer. And uh, the, he's really trying hard to look interested. And uh, at least he's there. So, uh, anyway, so th th these are good conversations. And now we're all on the same page about this. When you start to raise these things by priority, you end up with a couple important anatomical components of a story map. The things at the top are these absolutely necessary things. These, uh, they're quick ways to talk about the system, end up being what I refer to as a backbone, which is a term stolen from another person who uses it slightly different. But uh, the backbone of the application ends up being these core capabilities, these things that we need to have in the application. What's important about them is they're big and they're stupid to prioritize against each other. If I were to boil down the, the, the necessary big capabilities or big things in a car, I might end up with engine and transmission and brakes. And a dumb question for me to ask you is what's more important, the engine or the brakes? Can you prioritize these for me? What ends up happening is we start to prioritize things underneath those things and the, the, the stuff at the very top, the stuff that we absolutely need to have, ends up being what Alistair Coburn refers to as a walking skeleton. If we were to build that part of the application, we've got something that demonstrates end-to-end -end functionality. We've got a car that will drive us to work. It may not be the car we want, but, it, but it's functionally complete in some way. I'm going to skip over that. This is covered kind of in the handouts, but one of the, there's a lot of things that you do when you're walking through this stuff. So, uh, any, so here we could have you build this thing and arrange a story map. Who has energy for that? <laughs> Not I, said the duck. <laughs> Not good. The duck is speaking. It's, a, it's and any questions about that sort of stuff? Before I move on, well, I guess yeah, please. It's sort of like in Alistair's nano development thing yesterday, we were saying that uh, developing a nano increments can lead to really bad code. If you if you design the stories for the minimal car that will get you there, I'm imagining sort of like a you know geo metro with no body panels. And is that really a suitable skeleton for growth as you build out? So if everybody heard the question, is it, you know, if we built the minimum for everything, you know, if we were to you want a Mercedes, I'm, I'm going to start to paraphrase you, if we were to build a, a Geo Metro with uh, body panels missing, it may not feel so good. Uh, it, it would be sufficient. It would cover all those basic things we need to drive to work, but, uh, but it's not good. So 
So, do we address that, or is that more of a software engineering issue? We're really talking about the user experience and gathering requirements. Yeah, we are talking about you know, moving or uh, from this understanding of people and what they're doing and starting to, as soon as we start jiggling things around by necessity, we're starting to think about what they absolutely need to do to succeed, and then we start to think about, what happened here? Oh, okay, that's, uh, we start to think about uh, uh, what we absolutely have to build or support. So mark that, and yeah, actually I want to come to, there's, you, we're hitting, there's some of my slides are a bit of a best of here, and this is a, you're talking about a, an aspect that uh, refer to as, I don't refer to it, and we'll talk about subjective quality in a minute, uh, and what, what quality is. Uh, for me who wants a car, I don't care if I have a Geo Metro that doesn't break. That's not the kind of quality I'm thinking of uh, when, I, when I want a Mercedes. Every uh, folks seen uh, the planning onion before? Uh, who has seen this, this model before and wants to give me a basic definition of him that isn't a certified scrum train? <laughs> anyway, can I pick on you? Uh, no. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, you've seen it because you've heard me talk about it. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, anybody, can somebody give me a, a quick thumbnail of? Yeah, please. Starting with a vision and then a milestones or a roadmap and then going out. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's what a, a PMI people uh, like to think of as a agile developments, rolling wave planning kind of thinking. It's a, uh, basically there are layers of planning that we end up doing, starting with understanding something about the product and its vision, moving down to something about uh, incremental releases or what we release, and then moving farther down to talk about what we will build in the next iteration or sprint. And then I put at the center of my planning onion the user's story, where some people put the day inside of there uh, to plan what we're going to do today. But for me, as a, someone who's thinking about the, the product and what I'm building, the, the sprint is composed out of stories, or the iteration is composed out of stories. So we have lots of different layers of, of planning that we need to go through. And so what I want to focus on is this release thing. The release thing is the thing we put in front of people and it needs to deliver some benefit or some value. And I couldn't deliver a car, even if it is a Geo Metro, without engine and a transmission and brakes. Now I could develop a sprint with little bits of stuff complete. I could build an engine in the first sprint and I could build a suspension system in a second sprint, but I certainly couldn't release uh, without it. So when we think about release planning, we need to think about slices of value or slicing about what's beneficial. And I started using this sort of approach and what happens is you start to really see what the stuff is that's valuable by being able to quickly cut slices through it. I found that in practice I used to cut weird slices and they would come out a little bit uh, jagged and things would cross over things and the, the models looked a little bit weird. But I found it was really easy to start to facilitate an activity if I just took a roll of tape and started uh, putting tape lines across there, uh, uh, from left to right, and having people start to juggle or move things up and down. So this is a, a, a butt ugly story map after uh, working with some folks and prioritizing and annotating things and attaching estimates and attaching some, uh, some notion of what business uh, benefit is and it starts to get decorated with a lot of valuable information, but it's still a, a, a place where we can have conversations about the whole system. Each one of those vertical slices is a bit of a, a release. So uh, we end up you know, starting and arranging the, the, the top, the backbone, the stuff that is kind of durable, and then moving from that backbone to uh, an arrangement of stickies that lets us know what's in a first release, what's in a second release, and what's in a subsequent release. And right away, you can see how fat each release is relative to the others and how difficult it is. Uh, this is a bit of a play-by-play -play from doing a large collaborative release planning exercise at an insurance, at a major insurance company. The, the person who is the product owner that knows this backbone has written all these stories, starts by uh, laying out a big wall and she printed these out on white paper so they're a little rough to see but it's gonna get a little crowded and getting the basic structure uh, of the organization of the stories arranged. 
after getting them organizing, organized, she talks through them. She'll talk about, okay, this is the, this is the experience someone has of selling a policy and uh, making a claim. And this is the, the basic, these are the big things that people have to do. Did I hear a question bubbling up? Then everybody gets a stack of stories and we, they go to work piling them in or filling in the structure. Now she knows where they go, and, uh, but, and she's not putting them there. If the whole team puts them there, then they know where they go. They know, now they understand where they go. And once we get them into the basic structure, and we start to have this sort of inverted cityscape thing, we talk a little bit about them and fill them in, and then the tape lines come out, and we say, okay, we've got to build this thing in some series of incremental releases, uh, these are our general goals for each release. How should this go? And this ends up being a big collaborative activity punctuated by strong discussions around specific areas and lots of uh, beginnings of decoration of, of estimates and dependencies and other concerns that people have. And at the end of the day, we end up with what feels like a release plan that we can live with that was built collaboratively. So that's, that's the way this kind of planning goes when you've got a one of these. Has the folks done any uh, similar planning sorts of activities before? Anybody? This looks more grown up compared to what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's, uh, there's a common mechanism of just sort of arranging things left to right by release order. And uh, uh, that's a, a good common way, but we start to lose the plot. We lose the structure. So this is planning on the back of that structure. And it uh, seems to work. People can look across the structure and they can imagine a whole product based upon everything in this uh, left to right lane, and uh, it, it sort of speaks to them. I've generally used in or out for the next build. And this is better because out feels, to the business owner, out can feel really uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, we're going to talk to, we were talking about the person from Rally and we were talking about the puppy and, and, uh, and uh, so you just put it down on the bottom floor. Yes, and there's your puppy, yeah. it's right down there, it's, it's okay. It's a, <laughs> But uh, you know, people will keep track of their puppies, and this is a, the, because this is big and spatial, people can still see them and they're, they're there. So, so uh, there, there's a secret to prioritization. Before I go on, what, what is the, what is the, the, the secret to good prioritization? Important stuff first. Important stuff first? Okay, so uh, anybody else have any tricks to prioritization? Negotiation. Negotiation? Send everybody else out of the room. <laughs> call them back in when I'm done. Uh, that didn't work. <laughs> Has everybody heard that? Send everybody out of the room and call them in when I'm done. Uh, there was, oh. Right people doing the prioritization. Yeah. yeah. Well, what makes people right? Well, basically the ones who, the, the key stakeholders. The right? key stakeholders. The key customers, the key people who are going to be the, the ones saying yay or nay. Uh, and, and sometimes it's technical people. We actually yeah. are going through a process right now to make for IT prioritization so we can balance operations with project work. So we've gone through a, a huge process um, over several weeks figuring this out. And um, after the first couple of meetings we figured out, we actually need to technical people in the room because the people who are on the business side, although they could say these are business drivers, we didn't have enough understanding of what the technical people were doing on their side to be able to fit the prioritization into a real time, real world. <coughs> That's right. Uh, so it, sometimes it is, uh, you need those people in the room that really knows where, know where the business benefit is. You're exactly right. But sometimes, uh, like an example I just stepped through with the insurance company, lead developers were in there. The business person kind of knew what they wanted, but they didn't want to suggest anything stupid. They knew they had to hook up to rules engines for determining policy pricing, and uh, there was a lot of, and they were trying to release in multiple states, and multiple states have different rules, and we got to figure out which states to roll out before other states. And there was a lot of technical junk they just didn't know. So uh, it needed to be a little bit of a discussion. So uh, my trick uh, for prioritization 
is the idea of not thinking about the functionality, back to this goal, task, tool thing, is to try and distill and name what the business goals are. What does the business get or what's important to them? And I coach people to, these three vocabulary words have been kind of valuable to me. Uh, uh, and they were laid out, uh, well, doesn't matter who they came from, but output is, is what we build. The stories are oftentimes about functionality or things that we're trying to build. And it's difficult to prioritize output. So at the, at the end of a release, we will have some software. But outcome is what I get after the release. That's what I hope to, the benefit I hope to get from a business perspective. And uh, impact is the, the longer range benefit. The person who described this, these three terms uh, was talking, uh, used as an example, uh, what is the organization, uh, who are the, the guys that, uh, the, the kid band that wears these uh, rings on their finger that uh, a pledge uh, chastity or <laughs> Jonas the Jonas Brothers. Uh, uh, yeah, what is that organization that uh, does that? Disney. Disney. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, yeah, you've seen the South Park episode. <laughs> uh, 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 there is an organization that promotes uh, uh, you know, abstinence. And uh, well, at, the that's the U.S. government. Yeah, it's, it's a, a lot of policy supports that. Uh, so the, uh, they had come up. This particular organization had come up with an idea that they would have uh, what they were referring to as an abstinence ball. So this was a this was a nice uh, kind of a daddy daughter event where we we would invite fathers and daughters, and they would come to this kind of a black tie affair, and they would show up, and it would be a nice uh, uh, uplifting sort of experience where. Uh, a bonding experience for fathers and daughters and, to, and they would make this pledge and both fathers and daughters would wear a ring and, and, and this would be a neat event to kind of commemorate this pledge. So they came up, they hatched the idea for doing these and hosting these things and uh, the output uh, for them was sort of the, the execution of these kinds of events. And the outcome by all respects was, was good. People showed up, they were well attended and people really loved them. They had a great time and uh, Everybody said on the, the, the way out and later that this was a great experience for them and they would, they would definitely do this again and they proceeded to plan more of these sorts of, uh, sorts of balls. So, so the outcome was good and what they were shooting for was this good positive outcome. There was a problem though that they, after doing some research a little bit later, they found that the, the teenage pregnancy rate for women, girls who had attended these balls was higher than women <laughs> who had not attended the ball. So uh, while the outcome was good, the impact was bad. So I find that a lot of organizations are struggling with strategic goals. We, we want to have better customer service and we want to, be, we want to improve our net promoter index, the, the thing that uh, causes other customers to recommend us. And then we have these short-term tactical things. We want to stop customer service from getting so many damn calls, or uh, we, we want to get rid of the bugs in these areas, or, or, or basically, uh, it's back to the getting rid of the bugs in the areas is output, but uh, basically we find that we're juggling sometimes different types of things. One of the things I focus on is just getting people to name those things. These, yeah. uh, these, oh, I'm sorry. Could I kindly ask you to go to the, the top one? Uh, slide? Yes. yes. No, 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 the one with the output, outcome and impact. Yes. In your model, the impact is something that people think about in advance, or this is something that we learn, uh, you know, as things evolve. Namely, if the outcome that I want is this kind of thing, or another in the market, would I be also speaking about the impact, for example, another result, uh, which would be the dominant player in Brazil? Or would it be something that I learned, just as an example, with the fathers and the daughters, uh, as things evolve? Yes, how much of it is pre-planned or, or envisioned, and how much of it is the feedback that I get yes. once I have my outcome? Uh, so how much of that is envisioned and uh, how much of that is uh, emergent, how much comes out? Comes out and gives me feedback. Uh, or it gives you feedback. So uh, I'll answer the question. First of all, you know, both output and impact are not something you can, there's something, that they're very uh, 
lagging indicators. I don't know what the I don't know what the real output and the real impact is until later. That's the nasty thing about them. Uh, it's easy to measure velocity and story points complete and bugs. It's difficult to measure output. It's incredibly difficult to measure impact. It just takes a long time. So yes, there is emergent output, outcome, and impact. But in the example I gave, they clearly went about it with the idea of what the, the, the impact they, the impact was their strategic goal as an organization to reduce teenage pregnancy rates, to uh, cause people to make better decisions about premarital sex. They knew that that was their strategic goal. So it certainly was a target. And they chose the thing to do, the, these balls, as a way to drive towards that impact. And it missed. So, but they only knew that you know, a long time afterwards. The, 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 and I find that uh, when I'm working with stakeholders, and I, we start to talk about a little bit of a model like that, they often come to me with, we got to build this feature. We have to add this capability to the system. And uh, you need to pull out your Y stick and you need to start poking. Uh, what will you get uh, when, you, when we build this? What will, what, what, when we release that, what's going to happen? And we can start to understand the, what the outcome is. And uh, some organizations are kind of in tune with the impact. They're long range strategic things. They can name those. And so we can, we can ask the question, how is this helping us uh, meet this strategic objective? Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but you... Well, the question might be started. There is no simple answer to it. There's no simple answer. Do you have the time we So what I would find, you know, my trick or secret to prioritization is to push people up and to talk about something other than user stories. It is to talk about the benefits that we're trying to strive for. If we can name those benefits or those things that we're looking for, and we know that some of them are short-term, are, are uh, uh, outcome centric and some of them are long term that they weigh in on strategic and sometimes there's a bit of a benefit soup going on with any product. If we can just name them, we know that good benefits eventually result in our, in our organization s uh, saving money or earning money and a good benefit, if it's articulated well, describes uh, something that's relevant to this product. This uh, uh, big benefits like earn more money is not so specific. For the, the Barney's example we were discussing, there's a lot of ways to earn more money. There are, uh, we could launch better marketing campaigns. We could uh, uh, hire people with less tattoos. We could uh, do lots of things. But we want to articulate a product goal that says we're, this, this kiosk is going to earn more money because it's going to stop people from leaving without finding what they want. So in some of your handouts, there is a, if, uh, I didn't print out a lot of these, but they're available someplace. There is a page that has uh, product goals, uh, candidate product goals for Barney's. And those, uh, those give an idea of the, the simple one sentence things that I seek to describe to help people prioritize. And going deeper, we can start to ask the question, if we were realizing that product goal, how would we know it? What would we see change in our environment? And again, more cash in the bank is a trailing indicator. It doesn't, doesn't help so much sometimes. The, these measurable product goals, if we can understand them, sorry, page too soon here. If we can understand them, we can start to prioritize towards them. If we can name six or seven or eight of these things and have people rank these product goals, then we can say, okay, well in the first release, we want to realize these one or two, then, we can start to deal with building a bit of a product roadmap because what's necessary is necessary with respect to what I'm trying to achieve. A lot of dogma I just spat. Does anybody, has anybody done anything similar to that when they're trying to deal with prioritization? Yes, no? Yes. <laughs> More of a roadmap never that bad, but should never never at this level. Yeah. It, it does end up being a bit of a road map thing. Let's see if I can spin through quickly. There's a couple slides in the deck that, that deal with this, uh, this, this hierarchy. Uh, we know that we have business goals and those business goals require that people use our software and those people will do things and we will figure out what will support them doing with 
uh, with user stories that, uh, about the, the tasks that, the, that they're doing. And when we start slicing things up into incremental releases, what we, what we need to be sort of aware of is that we are slicing top to bottom. Uh, if I slice off a particular piece of scope, I need to talk about what can users not now do with the product. And uh, are there different users that we're, that we're serving? Are we taking some users off the table? So I find it's a lot easier to prioritize business goals and user constituencies than it is to prioritize user stories. But if we don't have language for our business goals or language for our users, it's extremely difficult. If we can't say that at Barney's to really solve the problem, we need to deal with impatient buyers first and casual browsers later. And so we will build a user interface that allows people to, to find things when they know what they're looking for, and we'll deal with these kind of meandering people with the product in a subsequent release. So. Yeah, Jeff. Um, you're talking about software at the bottom level, use at the second level, user constituencies at the third of the business goal. <laughs> Yeah. Where does the business case for building the software for a particular use and particular constituencies come into play as a way of achieving those business goals? Uh, so uh, this question was, where does the business case uh, come in? For building the software this way <coughs> with these uses for this constituency yeah. to achieve these goals. I don't have a good answer for that, frankly. I, I, does it play any role at all? Or? Not for me. Okay. Personally, I go into, I walk into organizations. Uh, first, uh, who in their organization has a, uh, builds business cases for their software? Is, it, is anybody doing that? No hands. Who is who's still here? <laughs> so, uh, so nobody's organization builds business cases for things. Of, well, so, okay, so, the, so the vertical lines that you've drawn aren't those somewhat of a of that. I mean, you, you have to make those decisions. Release version one, two, three. Yes. Isn't that what these are? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so correct. you just turn it 90 degrees off of what you had on the board. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a good, how's that for it's cognitive that dissonance? Really that's how you're making those decisions is, okay, somebody at, at, in marketing and somebody in sales, and these people are collaborating together as we show this picture. And we're moving stickies for a while until it starts to gel and solidify and stick it there because it supports the business case. That's what I was extrapolating. I'm not sure if that's yes. what you were even asking, but I was that's what I was drilling out of that or well it, it's the question, how do you know to the extent or how can you reasonably believe that building the software take take release one there. Building release one with the activities and tasks for that use, and that constituency will achieve that goal, that slice of the goal. How do you know that, or how can you reasonably believe that? Is it a crapshoot? Or? It's a crapshoot. Um, all software, this is a, a mantra in the Agile community, is this prioritized by business value. Uh, I'll make a bold assertion that the business value of software that never gets used is fairly low and we don't get value from software until it's delivered and used. And all, uh, all estimates of business value are a crapshoot. We, we are always making a hypothesis that someone will use it and it will generate the value we ex expect. So what I find in practice is uh, organizations have these business cases drawn up and they're uh, absolute crap. They, they, they sort of obfuscate what's going on with lots of bogus ROI numbers and bad assumptions and no specifics about who will use the product and, and uh, uh, things like that. And they're uh, it, it often impenetrable. So what I find is that I get ahead by pushing the, and oftentimes when they engage in prioritization discussions, they're working at the leaf node level or at the bottom of this stack or at big pieces of functionality. If we can make, if we can, build a backlog of business goals and prioritize those, we get farther. And those business goals end up being fairly short statements about what the benefits are that we'll get. But, I mean, you go to an investor, and he says, well, I want to make money with this investment. And you just said earlier that there are lots of ways you can make money 
I mean, you used an example of Barney's store, but there's a lot of ways they could make money. Improve parking, plan, yeah, yes. Now, you can ask the same question about reaching the business goals. Maybe there are a lot of different ways they can reach the business goals. You come up with one product roadmap, let's call it, that you think will lead to those business goals, but why is that any better than the other one? I mean, don't you, have to, don't you have to have some kind of case? What you're doing is making your hypothesis visible. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And that's all I'm suggesting is yeah. let's have the conversation about it before we start prioritizing. Prioritization fistfights often uh, are because we have different hypotheses about where the value comes from. So let's go. Let's talk about that specifically. So that's all. So full and stop. You think it's, that's the best you can do. it's the best. Well, it's the best answer I've got. And and frankly, it's uh, the. Uh, discussions about where the business value is coming from uh, are in most organizations that I participate in and it's been a few by now are wacky crazy discussions that have never happened before now so it's a it's a good incremental step so uh, though I'm sure there may be better there is a, Jeff, is it a case of somebody says you know plans are bound to fail but that doesn't mean you should that's so, correct well, uh, it's exactly it's, the same so you can argue that Having a business case for achieving a business goal may fail, but that doesn't mean you don't do it. That's correct. It could be a good thing to do. And, and what I see is people not doing it or doing it in, in a way that's, uh, if stories are a token for a conversation, and I, I don't want to uh, plow on forward, but this, yeah, this is an interesting, this actually is a thing that I spend a lot of time ruminating on. It, it's, if stories are a token for a conversation about what to build, what is the token for a conversation about what's beneficial to us as an organization? And if it really is one of these boundary objects that's a good token for a conversation, what do I write down so that I, it facilitates a conversation between multiple people, between people who know why we're building things and people who know how we're building things? And, uh, and that's what I'm sort of shooting for, is something outside the backlog. And it's as perfect as stories are, which is not. So. Let's um, plow through really quick. Uh, the, the last sort of statement in here is that, and this is kind of in the, in the quick handout here, is I, I find it very valuable to build a roadmap that's composed of not the stories that we will ship each iteration or each sprint, or excuse me, or each release, but what the benefits are for each release. So uh, a quick, my quick roadmap recipe is to give each release a name, and then in a sentence answer the question, what does the business get, or what outcome, or, or what benefit do they get after each release, and what do users get after each release? This is the thing we'll prioritize by, this is the thing we'll make decisions with, and, and, uh, and by, uh, let's say what I mean by that, we might have prioritized for a variety of reasons, but if we can distill back up and say what's important, why are we building this release? And then we might bullet list some big stories or big pieces of functionality that are in the lease. But at the end of the day, the release is a failure, or at least it was off target if it didn't get us this benefit. It's not on target if it delivers the, the functionality. It's uh, on target if it delivers the benefit. So we, we draw attention to the, the right thing or the right discussion. Um, all right. I'm going to go into a little bit of a, a bit of a best of, and we're going to go to the, the last box in this thing, and this is on construction. And I want to, uh, before I move on, I'm doing a lot of talking, and I, this is very extremely self-indulgent for me. These are concepts that I kind of want to get out there. And uh, any questions before moving on? Have folks seen that, everybody's seen that particular model with uh, traditional software development? And it's, it's DSDM that talks about this idea of, and it's bleeding off the slide on the left, of things being fixed and uh, estimated. We, we <coughs> fix scope when we launch into a software project. A traditional approach might fix what we're going to build and then based upon that seek to estimate uh, how long it will take to build and how many people we need or how many resources we need. And the, the idea is that in agile development, we are trying to flip or invert that triangle. We're trying to 
fix things like the time, we'll fix the release date, and we'll fix things like the, the number of people on the team or how long it'll take to build, but then we will estimate scope, which is pretty unfulfilling. Uh, it, it, stakeholders wince at, at that sort of thing. But if we sort of get through our heads that what people aren't fishing for is scope, people are fishing for benefit. And by doing that, articulating the roadmap as a series of business goals or our outcomes, we have leverage on scope. And when I mentioned this is how we make fine-grained prioritization decisions. And as we edge into delivery, this becomes extremely important. We need to start ask as we dig in and elaborate these stories and have more conversations about what they mean exactly, we can keep asking the question, how does it get us this benefit? I have to tell the Kentucky Fried Stick Chicken story. I can't not tell it, but uh, go ahead. Well, I, I kind of like to call shenanigans on that one. Oh, please, yeah, 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 please. Hey, yeah, I'm looking for more people to call. But you know, on that. I, you're just changing the terminology for the same conversation, uh, which is the, the one where the team says we can't deliver the scope that we thought we would, and uh, what do you want to sacrifice? Uh, that, yeah. that, that horrible conversation that almost inevitably occurs. When you have fix the time, fix the resources, and the negotiable thing is the scope. I'm not sure it matters whether I call it business goals uh, or I call it scope. I mean, I should just talk, hold the thought, and I'll tell you a couple tangible examples of how we, we've used this kind of idea mm -hmm. that, that's, that's helpful. So it, it is important to name these things. Uh, I've talked a lot about, uh, uh, folks heard me talk a little bit about the, the, the what's the difference, we, in agile development, we say iterative and incremental an awful lot. Uh, does anybody have a definition that works for them on those two terms, or do people see them as kind of muddy and blended? It's, yeah, about good to hear from you <laughs> back there. I see them as kind of different just because increment tends to say, okay, we're going to take chunks and do it, whereas iterative is almost like a loop. It's almost like an incremental loop where you're gonna go, you're gonna look at it, go back and reevaluate, look at it, go back and reevaluate. Yeah. And so you wind up doing a lot of rework in an iterative approach and in an incremental. It's kind of like one idea chopped up in that's multiple ways. Yeah, it, it, that's a good. Does everybody buy that definition? That's a good definition. The increment is doing things a chunk at a time, and iterating is rework. But the the cool new word for rework is refactor. So it's okay. <laughs> um, oh, except uh, if you're making the code better, it's refactor. Uh, if you're making the user interface better, it's uh, rework. Uh, so it's uh, still no term for that, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so the quick visualization is that I'll, I see a lot of teams suffer from uh, incre purely incremental thinking. They, they start with a vision or an idea of what they want to build. and. We break things into time boxes and we build some and build some more and uh, build some more and build some more and at the end uh, we finish and everything is fabulous and it's, and it's great. Uh, but it does require that we have a really strong idea of what we were heading for uh, and it does require dead accurate estimation, both of which are trivial, correct? <laughs> so. Uh, so, uh, what we seek to do is to take a more iterative approach, and that is the idea that we will tolerate change and tolerate thinking, and we don't know what we don't know. We start with a, uh, a rough idea of what we want, and uh, given a rough idea, the most appropriate thing to build is a, is a rough thing. Uh, so, if we take a more iterative and incremental approach, we might first start by building uh, something that helps us understand what we're building. And we might look at this and say, you know, really I'm thinking the smile is the most important thing about this picture. I need you to move her hand away from her smile. And I had thought of it more kind of in a uh, farmy kind of setting, and those rugged mountains are, are bothering me. Let's, let's write a user story for moving the hand and changing the, the mountains to, to, to be trees instead. Uh, that's looking good, and now we need to get this thing closer to releasable, so let's uh, add more richness to this. And, geez, I just didn't see her as a blonde, and, and the, this isn't California, this is Italy, no one wears that orange here. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, the somber feel uh, that I'm looking for. Let's, let's really refine this and get this ready for release. So a more iterative and incremental approach 
builds up over time. And uh, written on a board at ThoughtWorks where I spent a long time was, uh, <laughs> was the reminder to us all that it's not iteration if you only do it once. And uh, please be aware that this story will come back again. Uh, Alistair on his blog has something that he uh, refers to as a three card method. For every story that you write, write one card for the story and slip two more under it because you'll need them. Uh, the, 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 first, the first one is the story, the second one is fix the first one, and the third one is fix it again. And, uh, it's, uh, basically, we, we can think of it that way, but we do need uh, an opportunity to iterate. The problem we run into with the typical scrum snowman uh, uh, is that there is this box at the end that says potentially shippable software, and it doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, it's something that does get people uh, in a bunch when they're looking at software and it, make, it makes them afraid to try things or put stories out that aren't complete or aren't perfect, aren't shippable, because shippable from a product or a product ownership perspective means I would use it this way. And if I was, we talked about the Mercedes versus the, the what were we talking about? The, the Geo Metro. It's a, it's a, you know, if I'm building a car and I have a Mercedes in my uh, mind and, and, and our first story is for a steering wheel and you deliver me a plastic steering wheel, I was thinking of one that was wrapped in leather and, and, and much nicer. And I, we really can't move off that steering wheel until it's the shippable steering wheel. It's the story, it is the steering wheel that I want. Uh, and this is where we start to run into a bit of a trap. Um, we talked about user tasks because we've done deferring of conversations. To, you know, we might have had a task for steering the car, and now it's time to say it's time for us to build a steering wheel. If we talk about tasks, we did this late so that we could have discussions based with more context. If, I, if I've got this flower and I want to dig a hole to put it into, we now, we, we held our option, oh, options open by saying I want to dig a hole and now it's time to decide based upon how much money we have in our wallet and how much time we have what, what we want to dig. And it, this might be an appropriate solution or given the time a, a, a better shovel is good or really I think we can imagine a great shovel and someone recommended that we need a really architecturally robust shovel uh, and Someone said we could, we could outsource this to another, <laughs> we could buy it, we could integrate something that would be digging holes for us, and then the, somebody looks back in their wallet and, and, and we decide we, uh, that what's, what gives us the capability is, is something else. So we did all this deferring thing, and so we couldn't decide up front so that we can decide with context of where we are now. Uh, I've got a lot of interesting visualizations I want to do here. But, uh, uh, when we think of cars, and it's good you use this car, when we say I want a car, we build the essential backlog for a car, it does have engine and transmission and brakes, but we know that all cars are not the same. They are, I'm gonna do this example with a bus because I've extracted this and I had the visualizations, and uh, we know that there are low cost buses and uh, moderate cost buses and, and higher cost buses, and we know that all buses don't cost the same, but that backlog there is, is true of, of all those buses. It's, it's not just that. It's the decisions we make lower. Have, have, who has heard of uh, Noriaki Kano before? Uh, and uh, who would uh, say something about Noriaki Kano? Say, well, what, is, what does Kano stand for? Well, what, who is that dude? So what I know him for is, is the Kano analysis, which is basically trying to break up your features into um, kind of goals that they're serving, such as, um, gosh, we absolutely have to have this or we just can't go to market. Our car has to have brakes, period. Yes. Um, things that are more is better, right? The more horsepower our engine has, the better. So, uh, and then there's the things that are uh, really differentiators, right? So, uh, I don't know, wow, if we could have a heads up display, no one's got that. I guess people have them now. Yeah, there are things. So, get that? The, the, the Kano talks about the kind of splitting up features into things. And, and what is the, could you say, any, what is the characteristic of why would I categorize features that way? What's, what's going on with, with that? If I, 
So, so the usefulness of being able to characterize it that way is then to figure out what mix of those uh, makes sense to go to market with. So for instance, the ones that are gotta haves, so like absolutely, absolutely gotta haves, well, you gotta have them first. Yeah. And then the more is better. Well, the more of those you put in, the better, right? So you can, you can play around with those a lot. But um, if you can get a something like a really differentiator, the lighter kind of thing in there, yeah. that can be a big game change, right? You, you might even be able to go back and like throw out some of the stuff you thought you needed to have if you can get the one game changer. It, it starts to drive uh, the discussion about the product and not just what the functionality is, but uh, so what I'm going to get to is what Kano is really focusing on is this idea of subjective quality. The idea that what people like is a function of what will delight them. Uh, but there's, I, I, I've never seen the acceptance criteria on a story as uh, uh, delighted. I, I'm delighted, but I can classify a feature as a delighter. But this is back to, Reese, what you were saying. I'm hypothesizing that this is a delighter. I'm not. <laughs> I, I have no evidence and I can't green bar that delighting thing. Uh, but the idea, what Kano was really talking about and what the Kano method was a simple distillation of is the, is the idea that there is, there is objective quality, the stuff I can measure and see and validate and test, and subjective quality, the stuff that is relevant and pertains to the satisfaction of individual users. The nasty thing about subjective quality is, is that it's subjective. And the, and the difficult thing in an agile context where we put our engineering hats tightly on and we want all acceptance criteria to pass to get to done done is ignoring the fact that there is subjective quality. Uh, done in, in the eyes of a car buyer is done when I say it's done, when it is to, exciting and delighting to me. Uh, so there's more to Kano than the silly survey. The important thing here to focus on is the is subjective quality. Now you said the basics of Kano, the, the, there are must-haves. Cars have wheels and steering wheels and engines and there are one-dimensionals, but better gas mileage is better and there are delighters. Uh, there are uh, sunroofs and leather seats and things like that and the, there is this realization of this understanding uh, the, the quote from New York Times is that this car has many flaws, buy it anyway, it's so much fun to drive. And the, the dirty secret I've carried with me for years is you can deliver a lot of shitty software if people think it's cool or uh, like the way it works. And I'm looking at Gwen as I say this, who's been on my team and <laughs> seen stuff that <laughs> people liked well enough and, uh, and we knew under, under the hood it was <laughs> had many flaws. <laughs> But the important thing is we sort of focus on making sure that we're really capturing what people are trying to accomplish with the product and doing it well. Uh, uh, basically, in Scrum and Agile approaches, the, the idea of objective quality is the non-negotiable, that's the stuff we're measuring done on, and the idea of subjective quality is the thing that product owners or Agile customers or people like that pay attention to. Uh, uh, the, these things have a nasty way of decomposing. Uh, breaks are must-have, and the, uh, but what we mean really by that is stopping is a must-have, uh, and basic breaks will do that for us. But the stopping distance is a bit, a bit of a one-dimensional thing. I can upscale a break by making it stop shorter, and I can make it even better by making it anti-locking. And my Volkswagen has this light on the dashboard that flickers when the anti-locking is engaged, so I know why my pedal vibrates, and that's even more delightful. So features have features have features, and we can chop things up this way. But what we're chopping on is not presence of feature, we're chopping up subjective quality. This is the thing that we manage late in an Agile context. Uh, uh, cool visualization, the, the, the standard uh, mode that people fall into is that we've got a product with lots of big features, and. We will build this uh, iteratively in four sprints, let's say. In the first sprint, we get all of one feature, some of the next, and all of another one, and all of another one, and all of another one. And uh, at the end, we simply, we have a car with no tires or a car up on blocks. It, it's not complete. The approach that I'd suggest is that we take this kind of building up quality over time, and by quality, I mean subjective quality, 
and therefore we need a better story splitting mechanism. So this is kind of what's covered in your last box of your handout is now given a story map and giving an understanding of user experience, how do we start to iteratively chop up stories even finer grain? These stories need to be tiny size when they go into a sprint and it's now time to move them there. Uh, the, my chopping mechanism is based on my bastardization of Gerard Mazzaro's stereotypes. But uh, I look at what is absolutely necessary, like stopping the car is necessary. Uh, for a product, a, a form with just all the fields it has to have, but no real validation or other stuff. No, it's not shippable, but it's bare necessities. I can do that and I can see it work. I could uh, drive it around the block that way. If I add a, a capability or flexibility, uh, more fields, different ways to enter things, uh, uh, additional data, ways to look up information that I can't furnish by myself, uh, looking up product numbers versus furnishing them. Uh, so uh, we might see things like uh, optional input fields and lookups and data translation. There's a category that is curious uh, for me that Gerard uh, put in there and it actually works really well. It gives me a good talking point for this thing that I'm calling safety. These are the things that you don't see in your software if, it's go if things are going well. These are uh, things that prevent errors, things that preserve the integrity of data, things that, uh, th these are the fire extinguishers in your house. The, the, these are the features that, or the characteristics of features that you don't want to have to use but need there. And we can scale those up also. And then finally we've got this uh, usability performance and sex appeal. This is where we start to deal with delighters, making the product easier to use, easier to learn, faster to use, more effective to use, and then just plain sexy. And when you look at an Apple product, uh, Apple is very good about cutting away features and cranking up sex appeal on their products. They, they know what that mix is, and they know how to mix these things. So if we take this approach, and we know that there are at least four ways to slice something, and we were to take this same iterative development approach, we might start by first building all the splitting stories into just fine grain, just the necessities, the things that I absolutely need. In a second uh, iteration, I might start to uh, add in more flexibility or other sorts of things. And what's going on at the top there are some grades. Uh, one of the things that I work with people doing Agile to do is to say that, you know, yes, we're building iteration by iteration or sprint by sprint. But what's really important is whether we're ready to release. So a, a simplest way to, that I, again, stole from someone else to assess release readiness is to just grade things across big features. So if I were to give my product a report card at this point, it, it does everything that it needs to do. I've got a walking skeleton. I can see it work. But my grade point average is pretty low, a, a B minus and a C and a C minus and some Ds. But I've got two more sprints to go. If I build up more and, and build up more, and now it's time for me to release. And I didn't get straight A's, uh, but I didn't get any incompletes in any subject. I've got a releasable product, and from a subjective perspective, it's as good as it could have been. And, and by tracking releasability, or whether this product is ready to release, or looking at that subjective quality, it's a, sort of a handy thing. Is anybody doing stuff like that already naturally? Because I really said, people are smart. They just do this stuff. Is it, uh, you, you raised your hand there. Did yeah, we, we saw this with a, uh, something we're doing for our photo studio to get items in there for them to shoot. Um, the interface they use to control what goes in there to shoot right now looks like total crap, but it works. Um, and they can get stuff pulled in. And while we're getting stuff pulled in, we're improving what it actually looks like. It's kind of subjective to people. Is it so they're building it? The, you've got people in your organization building it as you use the product, or is this a commercial product? You're talking? About? No, this is us building it as we use it. Okay, so uh, it, it, and you, out of necessity, you start, you start doing stuff like that. I, it's not a, it's not a. And this is a, uh, in hindsight, sort of an obvious way to start doing this, but I see it's a failure mode that a lot of an awful lot of projects follow fall in. And a lot of people who are new to the, the product ownership role uh, don't uh, actively think about it. They don't plan that way. They, they 
really won't let that steering wheel go until it is lap, wrapped in leather and looks like a Mercedes steering wheel. Oh, we had to fight him for it. You had to fight him, say that again? You had to, had to fight him for it a little bit, but we got there. Uh, the fight them to make it look better or feel uh, better? Fight, fight them to accept the not so good looking, but at least uh, you okay. the jacket in your studio. Yeah. So it's, it's, and I've found that in some organizations, you go, uh, we find that uh, people will fight for building the, uh, the D plus version of the product, but the product owners are very suspicious or business is very suspicious that you will never get back and improve the grade on that thing. So by actually giving it a subjective rating, uh, a quality rating, you put, make it visible. You, we can understand it now. And there is so much attention to ob objective things in the Agile context. Dealing with subjectivity is not, a, not an engineer's favorite thing to do. So, go ahead, Christian. Uh, Jeff, does this, how does this work with uh, trying to complete a story, to, to marking a story as complete? Um, uh, you know, what you, the only thing you can specify is objective quality. This is a nasty th truth. But I mean, but is the, it, so here we have four sprints. And in four sprints, we've completed a story? Uh, that's kind of my question. No, what I've done is slice these stories into, I've taken one story that's big and broken it into a lot of constituent parts. And so at the very end, you go, so each of these slices that you've created are still, are still obviously customer consumable. Yeah, each slice is done, and that it has acceptance criteria, it's built, and people, we can use it and see it and touch it. But the grade level is over the original story. The grade level is over the capability, is over the, uh, and I end up using user activities for this sort of thing, or user tasks, the grade level is at a higher thing. And uh, you, know, you might ask, what the hell does this have to do with this story mapping thing, Jeff? Uh, given some sort of story map, I can look up the tree and I can grade at a higher level, and we can have a conversation and walk the map and say, what would we, what would we call this area over here? Ah, that's a D plus. What about this area over here? Ah, it's a, we're at a B plus there, that's good. Oh, then the next sprint, we ought to probably put some stories into this D plus area. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we start to drive conversations <coughs> like that, and putting more stories in brings up the grade at the higher level thing, and again, the, again, the reason for the map is that I can still see what the higher level things are and still have discussions about them. Without that, you start to lose the plot. So do you, do you just clarify whether your grades are activity-based or task-based or whichever the team prefers? Whichever the team prefers. At the end of the day, my, my dogmatism about using tasks and activities is just that. It's dogmatism. Big things and little things. It's just not useful to grade 400, 400 stories. Um, it is useful to grade. Uh, a useful grading might be on 10 to 12 things in a release, or less, ideally, so. Um, sorry to raise my hand for you, but ask the other question. What was the satisfaction level? What's your, what's your customer satisfaction level now that you've done that? Um, shockingly high, actually, they, I, I think they, they talk a lot about their subjective needs, but when you give them the objective, they tend to be pretty pleased that they got something. <laughs> so do you have something with the same customer care with where you didn't do that? Not really, no. There's a, see if we can start to, we're, we're at the tail end uh, here. There's a, you're, I'm thinking of something, there's a uh, famous person called, uh, named Jim Highsmith, who used to live here at Salt Lake and has moved on. Uh, does, are people uh, familiar, people know the name Jim Highsmith before? I credit him with, with popularizing the term barely sufficient. And, and we want processes to be barely sufficient. We, we want, and at a, at a functionality level, uh, there is this idea of being barely sufficient. Well, recently I caught Jim Highsmith saying, I don't say barely sufficient anymore because that's usually too much. Uh, yeah, because what you can do with these stories is build something far less than anybody reasonably accept. And if you can tell them, well, it's just the first sprint. But if it's, it's functional, it does something, it allows someone to accomplish something, you sometimes find that barely sufficient is a few notches below what you could have hypothesized it was before you saw it. 
back to software is all hypothesis. We're just guessing at some level. We need to start getting some feedback and leveraging it. So. And it does definitely that comes back to that the business case that they, yes. you guys were talking about over here. I mean, it seems like when you're dealing with this iterative, iterative approach, you're dealing with a scenario where you've got your core things there. And it, it can become a business decision much more earlier, you know, whether you decide to throw more money at it, you throw more time at it. But at the end of the day, you know, you haven't wasted a, a year and a half of development um, to, to come out with something that really doesn't add much value. You're going to know a lot sooner whether it's going to have value add. Exactly, and we're trying to get to that point, and we're starting the discussion early about that, whether we're getting this, this uh, uh, rating of a release readiness is relative to the business case. Is this an A in light of what we're trying to achieve in this product for this release, not A in light of all other perfect products in the world. So uh, it, it is a relative, yes, to a relative rate to that compared to that. Uh, kind of a dumb comment, really, but if you start delivering uh, iterative uh, sprints and you get the bare, barely minimum kind of thing, um, don't you, aren't you inviting basically an increase in your scope? Yeah, sure. Because people see it and then they want more and more and more and it becomes this huge never ending project. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was that again? To or you get pulled off on something else because, you know, this one's been delivered to some extent. I mean, you've got a whole other thing. Uh, what I keep uh, increases in scope for me uh, go back to having a good understanding of what our product goals are again. What, what are we trying to achieve here? And was, as people increase, uh, you know, we could. We, what I'm talking about now is a bit of a construction strategy of, of getting the all the basics in there before we uh, make it better. Uh, and but then what we do is say uh, if people start suggesting more and more now that they do this, that would be great if we did this. We could say you know is this is this helping the is that aiding the product goal? This is why we can't build roadmaps based around scope because then there's scope creep. But what I start looking for is goal creep. Uh, are we trying to achieve more with this product? And people will say, uh, you know, you're right. It isn't part of the goal. We can have it. It isn't going to give us more of that or less of that. And I was waiting for the excuse to use the Kentucky Fried Chicken mantra that plays in my head. Does anybody here, is everybody here, here in Salt Lake City uh, know that Salt Lake City is the home of the first Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, yeah proudly, you know, we put grease into the uh, <laughs> arteries of millions around the world and it all started here. But it Just, came from a southerner. And it came from a southerner, yeah, a Utah guy bought it from his southern friend. Uh, does anybody work in IT at Kentucky Fried Chicken so they can validate my story's true? Good, then I can tell it any way I want. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, I knew of somebody who did work in IT for Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, somebody that used to work at the place that Gwen and I used to, to work at, and uh, uh, they, in putting together the business case, they end up having to ask if they're building a report that they use in business at the, the bottom of this kind of one page business case they have to produce is the question, how does this help us sell more chicken? Uh, and they have to draw the dotted line from this strategic business goal and it's selling more chicken isn't actually very strategic. It's, it's just, we want more chicken. How do we, how does building this report get us there in some way? And they require people to connect those dots. I do that exercise often with product goals and I can keep those posted and say, oh, that's a great idea for this feature. How does that help us stop people from leaving the store when they know what they want? You're talking about adding this thing to the kiosk which shows a lot of rich information about the album, but we're talking, we've targeted users who know what they want. Do they need that? No. Is that gonna help us get there? No. Okay, let's put it in the, the next release bucket. But without those goals, you just don't have the leverage on the bottom of that you know, triangle we were talking about earlier. See if I can come up to a big finish. You know, what we're talking about is this, the folks might have seen this cone of uncertainty thing that uh, basically we know less at the beginning of a project than we do at the end. And I mentally uh, divide projects into three phases. And this is what's, again, summarized on the back here. Uh, the chess metaphor works well. There's a few other people in the Agile community that are doing that. There are stories that are, that are appropriate for opening game that, that help us build this functional walking skeleton and validate we've got what we want and, and help us start to better answer the question, is this, uh, uh, help us better address the hypothesis, is this going to get us the business value we intended it to? 
and the mid game, which is uh, fattening it up, getting it ready for release, and then the end game, which is dealing with a lot of unforeseen stuff and making it really sharp, getting it ready for release. And we're striving for this kind of build up effect. And uh, in my head, I usually do use third, third, third. And if a third of the way through the project, I don't have, a third of the way through the release, I don't have a way to get end to end through the, the, the value chain of this software, uh, then I'm, I get very twitchy. And if we're adding whole new features or whole new capabilities during the last sprint or iteration, I know we've really not followed this sort of strategy. <laughs> we've, we've adopted a high risk agile approach. The last thing in talking about this, this is something that Alistair talks, this ability to uh, slice up stories finely, uh, and what Alistair Coburn refers to as elephant carpaccio, uh, how would you eat an elephant? And you slice it thinly enough that you can eat it a little bit at a time, and so thinly that it starts to look like uh, carpaccio. Uh, and if we build things in an order that makes sense, that's sensible, we end up uh, in early phases building things that lay in big basic functionality. They have more architectural junk in them than, than they do value sometimes. It's, it's, it's the stuff that I use to, to uh, put something in the computer and uh, make something happen. Uh, but as we get this foundation going and the whole functional walking skeleton in, we start to lay in things that really make it rich. We get it, the, the business value starts to increase a lot. So we, we're, we're adding a lot of business value with every story we play. And then at the tail end, each story just doesn't, it's, it's making it better, but it's, it's polishing and it's, 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 it's good. So Alistair refers to this releasing on time thing, but leaving stories in your backlog as trimming the tail. Uh, for me, burn down charts don't work very well because I always leave something undone. And burn down charts make me feel bad about it. Um, that's, uh, and I don't want to. So what I'm in, what's important to me is that I get a product out that delivers benefit, not that I finished all the scope. That's not, it's not about scope, it's not about output, it's about outcome. Uh, now let's skip over that. I'm not going to have you split some stories. I decided to do all the talking. I, uh, I have parting thoughts here and I have none. This is the second to last slide. In a, this, I've unloaded a lot of stuff on you, and again, very, in a very self-indulgent way. Any, uh, can someone, any questions, or does someone have an, did someone have a, what, uh, oh, what is her name she referred to recently as a light bulb moment? Did something strike you as, ah, oh, this is a problem for us, oh, or, yeah, we're doing this naturally, we just haven't pointed it out. Did anybody have a, an aha that's interesting? Yeah. My well, aha uh, was the idea of classifying the, you know, the thing, the extra stories with the, um, you know, is this a, a delight or is it a, a, a one-dimensional thing, the, the breaks and the basic breaks. Yes. And, yeah, that my aha uh, was to categorize those the break down elements. Uh, just to come back to this, uh, so one of the teams that I'm working with that I'll go to tomorrow, they do this with their stories and they'll say, we're about to play this story and it's a delighter. And what they interpret that to mean is, we have an opportunity to make people really happy with it. So we will spend more time discussing and talking about how happy it is, how, uh, what we would, talking about that subjective experience. And they will tend to invest more time on it. And what it really means for the person who's the product owner is, they will talk to me a lot more and, and iterate a bit more inside the sprint and show me more stuff. Then they mark, tag things as baseline, as essential stuff. What it means to the product owner is just get this shit done and spend as little money as possible. I don't care about it. It's got to be in there. So uh, it, it put it in and don't talk to me about it. So it, it, we all know that there's a dial, a quality dial of how much twiddling we can do to make this story really good. And he's using that as his, uh, his dial setting mechanism to tell people about that. Now I've been waiting for the one other last thing to say is it, the, I said the nasty thing about subjective quality is that it's subjective. Um, and let's go back to the car example. Uh, possibly a, a good uh, a example of, you know, what's a, what's a linear thing that's in a car where the more of it we have, the, le uh, the better? Cup holders. Cup holders. <laughs> so, four people buying Ferraris 
Are lots of cup holders a delighter? No. Why not? It's a delighter. Why isn't it not? You, you said it's a delighter. Is he full of crap? Use wrong crap, too. It's just a delighter for a different customer. It's a delighter for a different customer. So the nasty trick, and if anybody has read Mike Cohn's Agile Estimating and Planning, and we talk about classing five features based upon desirability, for me, the elephant in the room, or the thing not discussed in the chapter that should be, is the idea of identifying who your customers are. Stuff, uh, you know, for people buying minivans, lots of seating is a delighter. For people buying Ferraris, lots of seating is crap. It's not what I'm interested in. Uh, and so we need to really decide for these customers or not those customers. So the tricks to prioritization, again, are the, are understanding the stuff outside the user stories and, and articulating them or being clear about them. And it is, I think it's time. Um, I am really, really happy to stay and answer questions and things like that, but thanks guys so much for sticking around and uh, listening to this whole, everything you ever wanted to know about user stories, but we're afraid to ask, this sort of discussion. <laughs>